to today's Object in R, in our Hidden Voices series, where we hear from women's rights activists whose voices need to be amplified. Thanks to Mary Milne for doing the tech and putting the video on our YouTube channel. Today, we'll be speaking to a young German blogger called Ellie Arrow, who has some interesting new findings on the homicide rates in prostitution. And uh, it's definitely worse than we thought. Uh, we'll be talking to Ellie in a moment. If you have any questions for her, please put them in the Q&A. Um, Ellie and I will be happy to answer them if we can. As you know, Object campaigns on all issues where women's biology and sexual or reproductive function is objectified, commodified, commercialized or sold, because this shouldn't happen to anyone. We focus mainly on porn, prostitution, sex clubs, surrogacy and transgenderism, and critically on the strong links between these issues, which the many wonderful single issue campaigns can't necessarily make. Um, our current news is that we've completed our surrogacy project. We found that um, all the women and women's organizations that we consulted agreed with us over 90% on all the 40 or so problems with surrogacy that we identified. So we'll be publishing that soon and sending it to all the people who contributed. Um, we've also got um, another piece of news. If you've um, contacted Object um, via the website over the past 14 months and not received a reply, please accept our apologies. We've discovered that website contacts have not been getting through to us because of a technical glitch. Uh, it's been remedied now and we'll be getting back to everybody over the next few weeks. So or feel free to contact us again if you'd like to. Um, a bit of key news from other um, organisations working in the same field. There's um, a sex trade survivors and exodus project called You My Sister, I'm putting the links in the chat. Um, they support women who are still in and recently out of the sex trades, who are often struggling, as we know, with addiction, violence, homelessness, mental and sexual health issues and parenthood. Um, they're running a life saving mental health recovery course for sex trade survivors and they're starting a new course on the 23rd of April. They've got a couple of places left on it. Because um, it's online, women can join from anywhere in the world. So if you work in or know someone who works in domestic violence or rehab or mental or sexual health or the health service of any kind, there are probably survivors on your books who are not identifying as survivors. So please publicize it to get the help to the people that need it. It's notoriously hard to reach women even after they leave the sex trades, because of course no one wants to admit that they were there. Uh, with one or two exceptions, um, our next webinar will be with the wonderful Rachel Moran, who has sort of taught us all so much about the reality of being in there. Um, other key news, uh, CEASE, the Centre to End All Sexual Exploitation, are recruiting. They've got a couple of uh, paid jobs, 20 to 25,000. Um, if you're interested in working, um, to end sexual exploitation, then the details are in the chat. Please contact them. Um, we've also been contacted by a, a social worker who finds that her profession is taken over by um, Stonewall gender wokeness and is looking to make contact with other gender critical social workers. So if you are one of those, obviously we'll be very careful. We won't pass your details on without speaking to you first. Um, do get in touch if you would like to. Um, just a little glitch, in, a little um, window on the past. Um, we've got an archive link of the day. Back in 2018, we were contacted by a very senior NHS consultant um, who told us, anonymously of course, of the difficulties that women with polycystic ovary syndrome were having to um, get the hair removal treatment they needed and how they were not being able to get laser treatment. They were being fobbed off with creams and, and things um, and obviously some of these women find it very hard to go out into public with a hairy face. It's not socially acceptable for women to do that. 
Uh, and yet um, men who wanted to transition were finding that they got immediate laser treatment for their beards, um, even though that's based on a belief in the self-diagnosis rather than a recognized uh, mental health condition. So there we go, a hairy unfairness issue um, back from back in the past. Have a little look at that if you're interested. Uh, so let's move to talk to Ellie, who is here with us from Germany. Um, Ellie's a young social science researcher and blogger who um, reports on Germany's formerly vaunted legalized system of prostitution, which is supposed to protect women from violence, from infection and from exploitation, but doesn't really. I was impressed by Ellie's work, particularly her focus on sex buyers, the invisibilized men who drive the system. Uh, Ellie's blog is in the chat and she runs the German page of Invisible Men. Prostitution is often called the oldest profession, but this observation only goes back to the writer Kipling in the 19th century. He also said in one of his poems, a woman is only a woman, but a good cigar is a smoke. So we don't, won't bother listening to him. Feminists know prostitution more accurately as the oldest oppression. But every good piece of new research we get shows that it's even more dangerous than we thought. We don't want to glory or wallow in this, and we don't want to make light of it either. It's all too easy to hide in the comforts of denial and worldly wise acceptance of the existence of prostitution. So we're going to focus mostly today on um, two key aspects Ellie's written about, the recently revised homicide statistics, and also the eyewitness observation of a German police officer who has written about his career policing the legalized German sex trade and who thinks the Nordic model is the answer. We already had the Swedish policeman Simon Hagstrom writing in 2016 about how Sweden's approach was drastically reducing the scale of the sex trade and now we've got another Bobby from Germany with similar advice. So let's ask Ellie some questions. Ellie, thanks for joining us today. How did you become a radical feminist campaigning on the sex trade? Hi everyone, uh, thank you for inviting me. I see there's lots of people from different countries. Um, so to introduce myself, how did I come to radical feminism? Uh, it started for me when I was in high school um, and just observing and the impacts of porn culture essentially, which is what I would call it now. Just everything from young people wondering about sex, of course, being curious about sex and then finding porn online and wondering, is that what sex is like? I guess it must be. And all that kind of confusion and harm that can come from that. And um, then asking myself, well, how is this actually produced? So how, how, is, how is porn made? And what really opened my eyes and started my interest in the subject of the sex trade is um, actually Gail Dine's work. I'm sure most people know her. Yes. And so she looks both at the consumer and the person who's used in the production. And I found it, um, yeah, really upsetting to see the amount of abuse of women, even in the legal porn industry. And as I kept researching, I found out actually you can't separate prostitution and porn. A lot of the women are in both. Porn can be advertising for prostitution. Prostitution can be advertising for porn. It just goes back and forth. And then, I figured out oh, I don't need to go to this valley near LA somewhere on another continent. I live in Germany. We have a huge booming legal sex trade right here. And there's a lot of abuse and violence happening right here. And um, so these were the major issues. Uh, and I found radical feminist analysis just well for one, one of the few groups that even talks about the issue and then centers women and doesn't blame women for what happens to them. Um, who is, yeah, and, and takes a historical analysis as well, which is really important in Germany because the sex trade has been around basically since Roman times. So um, I found feminist analysis really valuable. And also the tenet of, actually, we can do something about it. This isn't human destiny. It doesn't have to be like this. This isn't necessarily how we have to relate to each other. And women can fight back. And then just meeting other women, finding other women, um, of, from different countries, different ages, different backgrounds, um, that, yeah, I became part of a movement. Great, great to have you part of a movement. How did you start blogging? What was your first blog post about? So I run both a blog and a YouTube channel, so people who like to listen, I just 
you can listen to me talk 10, 15, 20 minutes. And I focus on the sex trade, but there's some other issues too. Um, and then you can also read it on my blog. And what I started out with, which is a very complex discussion, um, though, well, it becomes simple once you've sort of looked into it, um, is the question of sexual agency in the sex trade. I guess that phrasing is already a little bit strange. Um, the word agency is thrown around all the time and we don't even define it. What does it mean? But I think these words are important, agency and consent, um, because I do want a, poli well, I want politics that does impact the world and does pull more women in and open their eyes. And it's, there's so much discussion on the left and left-wing people about consent and consent culture. And we wanna be respectful and um, not, uh, hurt people's boundaries, even accidentally. And if we just apply all these things that we talk about to the sex trade, um, like we um, we talk all about the time about abusive boyfriends or landlords who abuse their power over over women, but in the sex trade, all of this is happening and it's like times 10. So that's one of the first issues that I wrote about how this is an industry one, the choice to enter, we know isn't usually a free choice. It's usually at least partially economic. It's not a stereotype women, the statistics in Germany are clear, do have often a history of abuse or neglect or something that did where they were hurt um, in their childhood or young adulthood. Um, these different factors push them towards the sex trade. Sometimes they're actively recruited. Um, so the choice to enter often isn't free. So if you didn't choose to be there in that sexual situation, that's not consent. That's a form of abuse. But let's say she did choose to enter. People like to talk about the high class escort who makes a lot of money. Maybe she has a university degree and she just feels like this is better than an office job. Even she is subject to the whims of a market. This is why I don't understand leftists who, who are pro sex trade because you're subjecting women's sexual boundaries to the whims of a market. So for example, in Germany, if there's an influx of poor migrant women, which there has been the last de few decades, then all the German women who we think are privileged and have it so great, that many of them are having to lower their prices, are having to meet men they don't feel safe with, are having to do acts that they don't feel safe with. Nearly every woman, including the ones who are at the top, have experienced some form of abuse, have had to compromise their boundaries, and so this whole talk of prostitution empowering women or being expression of agency is um, complete reversal and upon closer inspection, even for the women in the upper parts of the market. Yeah, absolutely. So it's well, not as it seems, nothing, nothing is nice and clean and tidy anywhere. But we'll let you um, tell us more about that because um, I wanted to ask you to outline how legalized prostitution operates in Germany. Um, it was all meant to be so nice, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, um, let me see how I can summarize it. So I think it's important to know that, like I said, prostitution in Germany has been around for a very long time. So we hear this year, 2002, that's when we got um, this law, the prostitute that, um, it defined prostitution as a legal industry, but it wasn't, it was tolerated or really it proliferated previously. Um, and this law in 2002 just clarified, yeah, this is a legal business, which means anyone can invest in it, we can tax it. It's supposed to also allow women to get, you know, insurance, register with the state, um, get, get the benefits of regular employment. But it doesn't work on so many different levels. Fundamentally, the law just hasn't understood how the industry operates, how it works. It thinks, um, it doesn't understand that most women they don't want to be defined as being a prostitute. They don't want to register somewhere and, and have this. This is more recent. They're having to carry out a license. Like this piece of plastic says, I'm a prostitute. No woman wants to carry that around. That's more recent. Um, there, were, there was less regulation before, I have to say, for quite a long time. And um, employment contracts did not materialize. Um, the brothel owners don't want these contracts. It's just easier to sue them if, if there are these cool conditions. So women are... They are um, independent contractors, which sounds great. She's independent. That means she controls it. No, the whims of the market still control it. The other women in the same brothel and their prices still impact hers. And when there's no contract, it also becomes harder for her to sue. And there's 
all these different ways. What it really did was make the profits that the uh, escort agencies and the brothels that previously existed, the owners that their profits they were making, they're now legal. Um, they can expand their business. They can operate freely. They can advertise sometimes in public. Technically that was illegal, but they just advertise anyway. So, um, and many places in Germany, especially Berlin, Berlin is infamous for that. There was just minimal regulation. You could open up a brothel anywhere and you wouldn't really have to fear anything. The German South a little more um, regulatory. Um, but well, it's a Catholic area, I guess, is it? The old Catholic sorry? areas? Is it the old Catholic areas? Oh yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but really it made business super easy for the profiteers. The women didn't get the sick pay and the um, um, what you get when you were when you just had a child, all of those things, the oh, benefits yeah, the the didn't materialize. Yeah. Okay. And most importantly, the abuse just didn't go away. And the homicide that were the homicide statistics that we're going to talk about show that most clearly, but all the other things that we associate with prostitution, unfortunately, rightly so, did not diminish. And there's more and more experts, um, police, uh, politicians, uh, women who experience the sex trade themselves coming out and saying, look, that the men who pay and the men who profit, most of them are men, they act with impunity. They can do basically whatever they want to us, maybe just short of killing us. Um, and we cannot go to the police for the same reasons as any woman can't report rape, um, trauma, f fear of being blamed. Um, in the case of women in sex trade, also precarious migration status. We haven't been truly empowered to the point where we can report abuse. And so it's not decreasing. It might even be increasing. Wow. Yeah. I was thinking about this and you know, the legalized brothel and the all the sort of underground stuff. Because it's basically the more you have a, a legal sector, the more the illegal sector proliferates. It seems to me it's kind of like you know, the, the harder you push, the more they pull. And it's, I was wondering if, if, would it be a good comparison to say that the official German brothels are as typical as the whole trade, of the whole trade, as say our English public school Eton is typical of the whole education system? Yeah, so I think the mega brothels in Germany are quite famous. People might have seen pictures, and might have seen them on yeah. documentary. And what happened for many, many years, even before 2002, was that the owners of these brothels were sitting in talk shows, on, on radio, just everywhere, saying, we're such good, we're such ethical pimps, we're, we're so nice, like the women, of course we take care of them. We have an in-house gynecologist where we just care about the women and their well-being so much. And then, okay, happy family, yes. <laughs> but if you actually sift through news reports, even prior to 2002, it's just strewn over the decades. So, 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 I've tried to compile a list, and I just, I had to stop at some point because I just, it just, it's an endless list of these brothels that are supposed to be exemplary. Actually, um, sh well, these reports show that all the things that we were trying to get rid of in the sex trade were still happening. So that's everything from the presence of drugs to the presence of organized crime, trafficking of adults and minors, rape and murder inside these brothels, yeah. which is what I would say, yes, they do represent the sex trade. And if this is the tip of the iceberg, the visible part, like you can walk past this brothel, like um, on my way uh, to, to uni, I had to go buy this mega brothel every day that everyone knows is owned by organized crime. They just put up this, this clean person at the front, um, who's the public face. Everyone knows this is happening, but you can't do very much because they're a legal business. And, um, so they, if that's the tip of the iceberg, the visible part is that bad. How bad are the illegal brothels? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Got a question in the um, Q and A from Anna Cleves, who says, "What is public opinion about the big brothels?" A friend of hers in Cologne said that the brothel, which has closed, um, had now got concerts in the building. So we're coming to talk about the effects of COVID, but um, tell us what public opinion. What strands do you get in public opinion about the sex trade? Um, so it has shifted. I think the most recent study on public opinion is about a year old or so that says the majority of Germans think that the laws have failed to prevent abuse and violence. The majority think that the sex trade is associated with exploitation and crime. We still argue a lot about what to do instead. And I can understand that it's scary, but we've been trying this different levels of regulation, deregulation for such a long time 
that I don't think um, we're going to go, for example, what many people want is the New Zealand model, which is uh, in some ways less regulatory, in some ways, not in all, than the German one. It's kind of the Berlin model um, of basically anything goes, maybe use a condom, maybe be an adult. <laughs> Um, that's not going to happen. German, well, we're infamous for a bureaucracy and regulation. We're either we're probably going to have either an even more regulated system, which is kind of the trend we've been going towards the last few years, or we might go Nordic. So there's increased support, but there's still a lot of fighting going on. I can imagine. Ah. Yeah. So, so opinion is split, but the facts are getting out there, which is good. Yeah. When discussing prostitution, policymakers always seem to cry out for statistics. Why are good statistics hard to find on prostitution? It's not like counting lampposts or teachers, is it? Yeah, um, this is a real struggle. I think for anyone, even people who disagree with us, uh, who have a different view on the sex trade, who might not be opposed to it or viewed as a violent system, to get really, truly reliable statistics is hard. We can get sort of estimates. And, um, but the first reason is in Germany, we don't have any official institutions collecting data. We started very recently collecting some demographic data that shows us the majority are impoverished migrant women, which again um, questions the idea of it. So it's a choice. It's just a job that women choose when they have lots of other things to choose from. But um, more detailed statistic, what is the day-to-day -day life like? What is the use, the, the condom rate use that everyone's interested in? Because they might not think it's abusive, but people do care about STDs. Um, the rate of violence. We had one study commissioned by the government in 2004, and there hasn't really been one since. Because the attitude is, we will stigmatize women if we study this group. If we suggest that they're vulnerable or they're targets, then that'll increase the public perception of them and as such and some, something weird like that. And that's um, an official statement from the Bureau of Criminal Investigations was, we don't want a further stigma. This is why we don't record crimes against women in the sex trade. So the first part is the, there's an unwillingness to study the history. We, we could change this. This is a decision that we made. And the other factors we cannot change, and that is that every participant in the sex trade wants anonymity. The third party doesn't really want to be public in case he gets down for a crime and his connections with organized crime come out. He wouldn't, doesn't generally want to be very public, maybe she. And the sex buyer wants to be anonymous. Half of them have a partner at home, maybe kids, or work colleagues or someone who might disapprove. They want anonymity and then of course the women themselves want anonymity women don't really and not, like i said a lot of them they don't want to register as a prostitute they don't want to be seen as one very understandably i think the stigma that the other side talks about all the time is very real we get this when women lay leave the sex trade and are whistleblowers about the industry they get told that they're stupid that they're nymphomaniacs they they're they're useless except for um you know sex and um so the reluctancy to talk to anyone, authorities, police, researchers, that plays a huge role. And then of course, a lot of prostitution is happening somewhere in a gray area, it's semi-illegal. And um, you wouldn't wanna be studied when someone that's part of that brothel or agency is actually continuously committing crimes, so. Yes, I've seen instances where on, on UK TV where somebody tries to interview a woman in prostitution and you get the standard answers about, it's all fine, lovely, it's a choice. and then. They've interviewed the same woman um, in a cafe later and she's saying well actually you know uh, it, it's a real problem I really don't want my children to find out and it's a completely different story can emerge and I let a lot of women I think while you're in that trade maybe you have to tell yourself these things that it's okay you know it's like a lot of the abuse victims and you feel completely defeated if you don't if you don't think it's okay and it's only later sometimes that you can say you know it's terrible I'm so glad I'm out of that situation. I think that's really important for us as feminists to understand and be really patient with women who say, I like, I like sex work. I want to be a sex worker. Um, we don't know what happened in her life. I wish, I think we should sometimes, um, I've done this myself in the past, so I'm not just pointing fingers at our people. I said, oh, she's just privileged. I don't know. I don't know what happened in her childhood. I don't know what, what's happening in her life now. I don't know if her relationship's healthy. I don't know what's going on. And to just withhold judgment and be patient and um, be compassionate to all women, including those who vehemently disagree with us. Yeah. 
Bodil's just pointed out in the chat that so, you know what you were saying about the, the stigma of preventing research from being done. She's saying that in Sweden, um, that their public study, which prepared for the change in the law there, included women in prostitution to give them a voice in, in the policy matter, um, which is important, isn't it? Yeah. I, I read recently a book called The Five about the victims of the Jack the Ripper killers here in London back in the time, and they were all known as prostitutes. But when this woman actually researched their stories in depth, she found they were just women who had nowhere to go, women yeah. who'd been subject to domestic violence at home and walked out because they couldn't take it any longer and found that either, you know, someone said upon them or they, the only way they could get in bed for the night was to have sex with a man. And we all, we all know that that stuff goes on in sort of, you know, layer of poverty um, with women all the time. I've met people at my local tube station who say, a young woman says, well, why is it that all my male friends who say I can sleep at their house want to have sex with me? You know, it's, it's just universal, isn't it? And it's not, it's not okay. nice. It's not about stigma, it's just horrible things happening to them. So, um, is it possible to separate prostitution from human trafficking, as some people suggest? Well, unfortunately not. Um, for one, I think um, there's an interesting uh, paper that was written actually by a woman who exited prostitution. Um, I, can, I can send a link about this later by Andrea Hines, and she talks about the choice to enter prostitution, we have to understand, is a, is a spectrum. So what some women might really do it without constraints, but most are constrained at least economically and then some women are trafficked. But all of those women can experience violence and abuse and all of those women might need some level of support or might need support someday to exit. And um, it's super difficult to distinguish these groups. And like you just said, some women will say, oh no, I choose this, but maybe there's actually an abusive boyfriend at home. Um, and she's not a position right now to see through his abuse. So if you, want to separate these you need to and no one's been able to come up with a system like if the let's say brothel inspector walks into the brothel and asks the woman do you want to be here how do you know that her yes is meaningful um a trafficking victim will be intimidated into saying yes of course i want to be here yes uh, mm -hmm. an abused woman a woman who's just busy trying to feed her kids all of those women will say yes there is no mechanism um maybe sometimes it's this very obvious bruising in her face you can tell but um, we have this idea, yeah, we can tell trafficking, right? It's shackles and bruises. No, it isn't. She looks like any other woman. She might even be free to walk around. You might meet her in the supermarket. You can meet a trafficking victim in the supermarket and not recognize because her shackles are invisible. And um, so, no, it's impossible to separate the two in that practical manner. And the other thing is that we know when the sex trade is legalized, demand for it increases because you're raising boys and young men to be like, well, for the stack party or as a hobby every weekend, you can go into the brothel, it's fine. But there isn't an increase in women who want to do it. So I really hate this comparison to legalization of weed because the government can be like, we're going to have our own weed fields. Fine, then you can grow it. But you can't grow women. So where do they come from? They come from the poorest of your neighboring countries. Or sometimes women come from like a lot of Thai women in Germany. They're from far away. Just the poor women and traffic women brought in from other countries. That's what will happen if you say to men, sex buying is fine and harmless. The demand will be met by trafficking. Um, just to finish this off, we know this for was very strong certainly in Germany because we had the scandal of a mega brothel being busted and the mega pimp who was on TV like I said on TV all the time praising his establishments he said it's not possible to meet the demand without organized crime there's just wow. not enough women showing up he said that on TV mm -hmm. well wow. he said it in, an, in a um he was quoted in a news report after being sentenced yeah gosh that's amazing isn't it and was that the Pasha one? Possible? Um, yeah, the, no, it was the Paradise one. But you see, there's oh. so many different brothel chains that have been busted for trafficking. Like, we're mixing them up. Right. So, yeah. yeah, well, it's good that people are finding out about that. That's amazing. I've read that, it's, that prostitution is the third most um, profitable illegal racket in the world after weapon smuggling and drug smuggling. What do you think? Yeah, it's extremely profitable. I looked it up again. It's it's among the most profitable industries. And the reason, um, there's several reasons. Well, one, these industries intertwine. So for example, a man, an ambitious criminal wants to get into the drug or the 
weapons trade and he needs sort of starting capital, he might need some to buy his first batch or whatever. Um, and recruiting women, especially poor women, some um, is relatively cost, the costs are low. Yes, you have to feed her and you have to house her, um, but the amount of money you can make off of one woman or a child, but even an adult per night, uh, if you um, exploit her to five, 10, 15 men, is just immense. It's four, four digits. It can be four digits. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the same thing the next night and the next night and the next night. Also, what will happen, some drug traffickers force women in the sex trade to sell drugs because a lot of sex buyers wants, want to um, consume drugs. That's another thing I should point out in terms of consent. Um, we know it's not a stereotype that a lot of women in sex trade, to cope with the reality, have to drink or take drugs. Yeah. And the environment is rich with those substances, even though it's technically illegal. What's not illegal, or at least I've never seen any sex buyer sentence for this, is paying to access the body of a woman who is drunk or high. That's normal. If I read on the forums what the sex buyers say, they can just do that. There's no repercussions. She was off her mind on something and he doesn't care. So I think that's wow. talking about the drug trade. Um, I don't think people realize that when the sex trade becomes legal, there's not really a barrier to men purchasing access to women who really definitively cannot consent. Yeah, it's amazing. Oh, someone's asking in the chat, they'd like a link to that sort of interview you were talking about where the, um, the brothel owner said on TV you couldn't run a brothel without, uh, or meet demand without organised crime. Maybe we can mm -hmm. sort that out later. Yeah. How important are the numbers? You know, after all, if 30% if or 50% or 70% of women in prostitution are there against their will or with no real choice, isn't it too many, whichever the figure is? Well, I think it absolutely is. Um, the, the key thing is that the sex buyer can never know. That's why, in my opinion, sex buying is unethical per se. He can never know, even if the chance is just one in three. If you would roll the dice um, and one in three chances somebody gets hurt, you wouldn't do that. But when he pays for sex, the chances are not one in three. They're probably more like nine out of ten times or more. He He's committing abuse. And because... Even if she's smiling or her ad says, oh, I do this as a hobby. Any trafficker will put that in her ad. I do this as a hobby. I'm a, I'm sorry to use this language. This is the language the trade uses, a hobby whore. Yeah. All men, most men, the ones who are not sadists want to believe that she loves doing it, but they can't tell. So, but even if it's just one in three and the other ones are really, truly happy doing it, it's, it's not ethical. And if any one of us was, um, we had that kind of choice choice um we had to make that kind of choice none of us would throw that dice well i tend to say to people if they think prostitution is okay so well, you know are you going to suggest your daughter goes looking you know around for one of the brothels in finsbury park for some work experience you know if that's if it's so good it's good for you and it's good for your your kid and your sister yeah um, it's all very well to say it's okay for other women isn't it those other women out there not me you know it, it's a it's a bit of a sticking point I should also mention what you're going to get with legal prostitution, which is probably gets one, some of the most opposition. Yeah, people do do care about what happens to women who are abused, but um, the poorest of your communities will have the sex trade outside their doors. You know about this in, in Great Britain. We have the same in Germany. The poorest areas of each city, um, that's where it's going to happen in the apartments and on people's doorstep. Yeah. And I do not want to demonize women who are um, in such vulnerable situations, they have to do it outside of people's doorsteps. But it does mm -hmm. impact the residents, it does impact women and girls. Um, so there's places that if, you, if you're forced to live there, um, there's places that I wouldn't go. I just would not go there even during the day, yeah. uh, at least not alone, not unaccompanied, because um, you'll get solicited as a girl or a woman. This just becomes normal. And if you're pro-sex trade, then you should be expected to accept the sex trade outside your doorstep when your daughter goes to school or your niece or whoever, or you as a woman of really any age um, can be, be targeted and it, it makes your life less safe, yeah. not more safe. They're, the other women don't shield you from violence, quite the yeah. opposite. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I would agree. Do you think governments sometimes use the lack of statistics as an excuse for inaction? It's, it, yes, absolutely, and it's so frustrating. We keep, um, the, the, the movement, the abolitionist movement in Germany, keep asking our government, please collect some statistics. Mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, but we don't have a problem, right? This is, well, it's changing slowly, but for a very long time they were saying, but there's no evidence that it's that bad. And it's because you didn't collect the numbers. So like, it, it yeah. And it's you, crazy. Start... you never say, well, we're not going to collect trafficking, uh, you know, 
traffic accident statistics because we don't mm -hmm. want to stigmatize drivers, would you? We'd never say that. So no, we, we know about we, violence against, uh, was it one of the most dangerous professions is driving a taxi? And most yeah. countries collect the statistics because we care about men who drive taxis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when it's women, oh no, no, because we'd stigmatize them, crazy. We're moving on to talk about uh, homicide statistics now. It's very grim and it's women's lives lost deliberately with calculation and in cold blood. We know that men never lose control. Before we bite the bullet, I'm gonna throw in one very positive statistic and please feel free to tell us yours in the chat. Over 10 years in Sweden, only one woman in prostitution was murdered. Well, because they have the Nordic model there. In legalized Germany over the same 10 years, 100 murders of women in prostitution were recorded. And I would think that shows that major change for the better is not only possible, but virtually guaranteed. What do you think? I think um, that, well, we need much, much better statistics on the sex trade and the homicide is a start, but it's not gonna tell us the whole story. And I think we'll talk about this later. Other, there's other ways that women's um, quality of life decreases or that they have an untimely death. Um, homicide is the most brutal form and um but the statistics don't tell us the whole story i have to say so yes yeah, sweden is very promising um and germany clearly looks horrific and but i think a lot of people will probably point to france and talk about how there's still murders there and i think it's important for us abolitionists to not deny that there's still violence in france after the introduction of the nordic model we have mm -hmm. to ask why though why hasn't it happened in sweden but it's happening in france so it can't just be the law there must be other factors and we need to investigate that so it's france's duty i don't i'm very proud of a lot of what the french feminists have done um and but we still need to keep an eye out like why is this still happening and what can we do um so if some people point to france and say oh clearly the nordic model doesn't work um that's what happens when you look at statistics in isolation and we need to compare them and we right now i'm not aware that we have enough information on the basis of homicide statistics to make very clear statements all we know is that under all systems violence continues and then maybe places like sweden have figured out some additional ways to make society safer that will also benefit women in the sex trade. Um, but it's very confusing. And depending on which numbers you look at, you'll get different conclusions. For example, um, like I said, a lot of people who are pro sex trade or um, want a state san sanctioned sex trade, they'll point to New Zealand. And New Zealand has had eight murders in the time that um, Sweden has that one, even though New Zealand has half the population. So if you looked at those statistics in isolation, you'd say, Oh, clearly the Nordic model is better. If you just look at France, you'd say clearly the Nordic model is terrible. So we need more information to make very clear. I talked to a woman called Sabine, who you may, may have said, who's um, I think Ingeborg, who was in prostitution in New Zealand. And she says, you know, it's not the same as Germany, but it's bad in, in slightly different ways there. You know, all these vaunted inspections don't actually happen, you know? Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's the, the intention is constantly, you know, not, not met. Um, so you've written, uh, participated in research and you've written about homicide rates in prostitution, which are shockingly high. I uh, had seen figures of 12 times the rate of any other occupation. Um, in other words, a prostitute is more likely to be killed, 12 times more likely to be killed than somebody at any other job. Um, what does the latest research show and what is the evidence? So what the information I'm going to give is Germany specific, but a lot of it I found looking at especially American literature, some British, is the same. So all countries I've looked at the most likely killer as a sex buyer. And we have to look at how and why that happens, even in a legal sex trade. Yeah. Um, and men don't even need in, in Germany, very few guns are being used to murder women. So it's not like the sex buyer runs into the brothel with a gun. Um, so I know this is a little bit distressing. I'll not, not try to go into detail, but um, one of the most important things that the study, which was done by a group of abolitionists, which includes an exodus woman, um, they found that um, a lot of men just use their hands or objects. So it's not enough to have like metal detectors. So you keep out the knives or something at the door. Just a man being there is enough to pose a lethal threat. And most likely that man is a sex buyer. And most likely he gains access to her uh, being vulnerable, being naked, because he gets her to climb into the car, or he gets to enter an apartment or call her somewhere. The, so the infrastructure of the sex trade um, makes women more vulnerable. Um, unfortunately, like 
that cannot be changed. Legalization does not change the nature that that encounter, uh, usually with a stranger, is um, unsafe. Although we also know that the sex bars include men who are long-term customers. So it could be yes. one case was a man who had known the woman for 10 years. Yeah. And then he turned dangerous. Or another man, he was, who wanted to marry her. They'd been seeing each other such a long time. He was offering her a way out, offering a way out, not yeah. selflessly. I'm going to rescue you, white knight. So it's both men that she's met before uh, many times and someone who shows up at her door for the first time. And it's women in the streets and women in the brothels and the apartment brothels and the big ones and the escort agencies. Like nowhere is really safe. I think that's important to know. And then I should mention this, um, this is quite morbid, but um, there's a lot of serial killers. So um, this one detective that was interviewed on the subject said, every time there's a sex rape murder, we look for a previous or a subsequent murder by the same man. We can, unless we have to catch him right away, it becomes a big priority. So killers out there should know that the police does take these cases seriously. Um, but, um, it's hard to, to catch these men sometimes because there's such a big pool of suspects. So this is yeah. just, again, it's the nature of the industry. Sometimes there were DNA tests done on thousands or tens of thousands of subjects. It's these crazy large numbers. Um, and yeah, it's hard to investigate these, but they are taken seriously by the police. Um, and- I've read that every fourth murder um, mm. is by a serial killer. Yes. And a lot of them are also sex buyers, so it's yeah. tricky to distinguish these two groups. Um, yeah, oh, I, think I read over this book by uh, Professor David Wilson, a UK book about serial killers. And he says that the two groups the serial killer is most likely to target are women in prostitution and elderly women. Mm -hmm. And I should say the, the victims include really, like I said, women of all sectors, women of all ages. A lot of women were mothers. Um, yeah. Uh, a lot of women, um, they, they had families um, who, yeah, lost a, a sister, a mother. Um, and yes, increasingly a huge number of migrant women, um, but also some German women. So a lot of migrant women, when they get, for example, women are sometimes murdered by their exploiters when they're no longer profitable. But usually it's the German women who get murdered because the migrant women are just sent back home um, to then be maybe hopefully they have someone to care for them or there's a home. Um, a lot of them can end up homeless or just back in prostitution in their home countries of Romania, or Bulgaria. And then the, if a German woman becomes useless to her pimp, we had a case of that last year um, of a young woman um, murdered because she was too sick. So she had been prostituted for two years while she was sick with schizophrenia, seriously ill. So someone should have noticed, someone should have, but the sex virus didn't call anyone. She was prostituted in brothels, so not in some secret location in brothels. And um, then when she was not no longer useful, she was uh, murdered by her exploiters. Mm -hmm. So yeah, these um, stories are, are quite um, distressing. And, but really I, we try to look for ways, how can we make it safer having Cameras there, security doesn't stop it. Having other women there sometimes end up ends up in a double homicide. So I think yeah, it is better than being alone, but it's not safe. No. Um, and I think murder just cannot be an occupational hazard. It cannot be. And if we look at the advice given to women in the sex trade, so obviously not all women get murdered, only a small number do, but high enough that every woman in the sex trade, when she gets advice from social workers, if you read these pamphlets of what do you do when you're sex working, well you right, you have a whistle, or you have a panic button, or um, you should not lock the door because you might need to run away really quick. You need to remember his face, write down his license number. Those are all situations that sound like you're expecting to be robbed, raped, or murdered, and that just cannot be an occupational hazard. Yeah, it's all too much, isn't it? And we have to remember um, that half the women involved in prostitution, I believe, are mothers. So yeah. when women get that's children that are rendered motherless and they're very often single parents so there's often nobody else to care for that child as well so they're, they're doubly victimized which is yeah. someone's let later saying in the chat you can never make this trade safe you really can't Absolutely and i think not. i wanted to add like um 
us it's, it's not like German or British women don't get abused, but the huge numbers of migrant women, I think we need really strong coalitions with women in Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine, Thailand. We need to work together like we owe it um, to, to um, women in, in those countries. Some of them have started calling what's happening in Germany because women die well of homicide, of, of illness, of suicide, of overdose, etc. Um, they've started calling it a genocide. I know that's a very strong word, but the numbers, this just so so many women from those countries being abused here and having their lives cut short um and homicide is the most obvious extreme way but there are others sadly yeah well we're coming to, on, I'm on to some of those others because um you've talked about homicide rates death rates are include homicide rates but are different and clearly apart from the massively high risk of homicide um women in prostitution regularly suffer substance addictions rapes frequent internal injuries mental health problems, sexually transmitted infections, and often multiple abortions, as well as the stresses and strains of motherhood. And all these things must combine to shorten their lives before we even look at homicide rates. Yeah, and we don't have, again, we, we like numbers. We have, the numbers we do have indicate that unfortunately it's not a stereotype. Women's health is usually impacted. Their lives are often cut shorter by impacts of the sex trade. Um, we have studies about the substance abuse and the just there's one very good study that I mentioned from 2004 that asked women and there's a there's an English language summary that I can share that asked women um, about all the different symptoms they have physical and psychological I think we just need way more studies like that really ask what is your quality of life what yeah. your rate of nightmares um, your rate of headaches your rate of vaginal infection all of those are yeah. quality of life so even people who might be pro prostitution i think you do care about women's quality of life so we I need to look at those in detail continuously yes some of these women would have had poor quality of life when they were children because they were often at best un underparented under supported children children whose families perhaps couldn't give them the love and support that they needed yeah. and may have been you know sexually abused using uh, substances at an early age so they may not have had a great quality of life before they got into the profession. Um, and as Bodil has pointed out in, in the chat, murder is always only the sign of how much abuse there is. For every woman who is killed, there were many women who were nearly killed, or who yep. were severely abused, or who nobody found out about, you know, yep. who went missing and nobody even noticed. You know, we know that happens too. But just to be clear, um, the research that you participated in, am I right in thinking it, it showed that um, a woman in prostitution is 18 times more likely to um, suffer homicide than a woman in any other profession. This was, um, this is, we don't have enough data from Germany to um, put a number on it like that. That's from an American study that followed yeah. women um, for many decades and found that the homicide rate was 18 times that of a comparable sample of the female population, but that is US statistics. Right, um, okay. Yeah. So we don't know for Germany. Sure. What about the figure that I've seen that some it's 10 times more dangerous to be in prostitution than to be in the military, even including men who are in combat in the military. Yes, yeah, and more dangerous than militaries, soldiers in combat, more dangerous than taxi drivers, liquor store workers. Those are also American statistics, I should say, they're not German. We don't have enough numbers in Germany. Then, that's because that. you're not looking in Germany for the reasons that's that you're We're not looking. Yeah, 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 crazy. Um, there's so many arguments um, against the myth that sex work is real work. What do you think are the best arguments? Um, I think there's usually two. One of it I mentioned at the beginning. It's um, not work like any other because sex in the kind of word that we want as feminists or I think most people want is uh, sex is not work. Sex is something you do freely when you feel like it. Um, it, should when someone else, it should be fun. Yes, it right, should so be that. enjoyable. Yeah. Not many, we used to have these laws in Germany until 1997. So when I was one year old, um, that um, a w wife owed sex to her husband legally. We have that you too. Cannot, you yeah. cannot be raped in marriage until we have that, that year. That was changed in 1991. Yeah. And there, we should never create situations where women feel any kind of pressure or duty to have any kind of sexual interaction. And I, all of us get it with the current, um, the ongoing, it's probably been around for a long time, of landlords pushing women to have sex with them when they can't pay rent or just instead of rent. It's so normal. When I was looking for apartments, when I moved to another city, I got lots of these offers. 
is so normal. I'm very lucky I didn't have to take them, but I know women who had to. And all of us recognize when the landlord says, you can either pay me or you can uh, give me oral sex, all of us know that's abuse. Cool. And prostitution is the same thing, except the man who abuses her isn't one landlord, but it's many sex buyers. So if instead of the landlord getting the sex, she has to go to the brothel to get the money, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. in a different place, absolutely. And the other thing that I would mention is, uh, I've already mentioned it, anyone who reads advice given to women in the sex trade, including by organizations who speak of, this is work, this is even empowering work, all of the advice, if this was given to you, you would run out of that workplace as fast as you could. So I really recommend reading them. You'll find them in any country. Um, a lot of right, very well-meaning social workers are handing these out. I don't even blame the individual social worker. It's the mentality behind, of, well, you just negotiate your risks. You're, you just become a clever businesswoman who like can, can recognize and you have these techniques and then it'll be okay. Uh, which creates the culture like of victim that. blaming, unfortunately. Absolutely. And they're saying things like check under the pillow to make sure there's a knife yeah. isn't there, or pretend that you've kicked your shoe under the bed, mum speak, so you can check there isn't a weapon there. But as you pointed out earlier, these men have got weapons at the ends of their arms. Yeah. They're bigger and stronger than women. They can usually overpower a woman with their bare hands, and that's all they need to do. Um, and it's the only job where you have to uh, allow access to most intimate and personable and pleasurable parts of your anatomy. You know, it's not like you're just renting out your hands to, I don't know, cook a meal or, you know, look after children or something, is it? You're the, 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 the most personal parts of your body are in question here and they're not in question in any other job at all. If we just apply that to the landlord example, say the landlord says, can you like paint the, repaint the hallway? Yeah. Or give me oral sex. Are those the same? No. So when when we get the same offer from you can work at the brothel or you can work for the construction company or the remodeling company, yeah, not the same. Nowhere near the same. It's completely different in nature. Yeah, I would agree with you. So has COVID made any difference to how prostitution is operating in Germany? Yeah, it's um, it's meant that uh, the situation very quickly deteriorates because we have not because we have not recognized the vulnerability of women, we don't have a system that can act quickly when there is a dire need for, some women are some women are starving, some of women don't have enough food. And I'll talk about the fundraiser later, that yeah, what we're, we're trying to, we're scrambling. So the abolitionist movement and different organizations are scrambling to just feed women because their income has suddenly uh, dropped. It has not, the sex trade has not been eliminated, it has not stopped. Um, some women have been sent back to their home countries, a lot of them through networks of organized crime, we have to say. Um, other women are stuck here, a lot of them are homeless. And some sex buyers, there's always been different groups of sex buyers, some who care about things like condom use and others who don't. And the ones who didn't care about condom use do not care about COVID. Like these are really dangerous men who don't even care about their own health. They, it's, you have to read it to to believe it but they'll talk about it on their forums freely like you can go there and there you can get it for a reduced price so yeah and we're like we're not using masks and we're not using condoms and another thing is a lot of brothel owners are then playing the good samaritan saying oh um we're going to let this women live in those rooms we're not going to kick them out they can you know a lot of women live in the rooms where they're also working yeah that's right yeah the beds where they're also working um they're like, oh, you can stay here. But we know how this industry really works. A lot of those women are going to accrue a lot of debt. They're going to have to pay this off. Um, and we have had so many examples of even these legal brothel owners just being abusive and just looking out for their own bottom line. We have to stop believing them when they say those things. And the, 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 the state that takes so much tax owes much, much, much better to women. The, for a long time, we had all these empty hotels. We could have help the women out of the brothels, put them in the hotels. Yeah, it's gonna cost money, but we just have to start believing that women are worth it to not be milked mm -hmm. by the government for Texas, but to actually get something back, some semblance of support and safety that yeah. they're not, not really yeah. getting the vast majority. Is it true that a lot of, um, of sex trade operators are cutting costs by instead of renting an apartment, using flats and holiday homes and occasionally like we, we would call them pop-up brothels here. Oh um, yeah, but they've so been doing this the for a long time. This has been, um, the, this, the, this trend has ex uh, accelerated probably because of COVID, but it's been happening for a long time. The vast majority is in these relatively anonymous private homes. Um, and 
Uh, but most of them are run by organized crime. P like people think women are setting up these co-ops, these feminist co-ops working together. Um, and they do have to now, but for a long time, they didn't necessarily have to register or they just ran them and no inspector came by anyway. So the law doesn't matter that much. Um, they're still doing a lot of that now. Some small brothels had to close down, but a lot of them are operating with impunity and um, they're being run by exploitative third parties the majority of the time. Yeah. Is there a particular type of man who buys sexual activity from a woman? That's tricky to answer. I think the answer is more closer to no, um, by which I mean it could be anyone. It could be your friend, your boss, your teacher, your co-worker, it could even be uh, the boyfriend or the husband, like we know a lot of men are in relationships with women. It's not even necessarily that they don't, they're not not getting sex and if you can prevent it by giving a man what he wants, um, it, it's not even necessarily that. It's, um, I think the only thing that all sex buyers have in common is the desire for very quick, easy, really at the push of the bottom, uh, sexual access to somebody where they choose when, where, how, and what kind of body. So they have these these advertising websites where they can literally say, I want a brunette. I want her to be from Brazil. I want these this breast size, this age group. They Which have is the objectification, isn't it? You know, this is what the extreme and treating a person as an object. All of us, like we hate it when movies do objectification. Some of us have started talking about how music videos are objectifying. Prostitution and porn are just pure object, like pure yeah. undistilled objectification. Um, so even if she consents to doing it, the system is dehumanizing. Literally her age and, and her breast size will determine the, her price on the market. Um, in Germany, the German white skinned women are obviously fetching the highest prices and the Romanian women are having to lie about their ethnicity, pretending to be South European to, to fetch a higher price. Or in New Zealand, you know, Maori women are going to be paid less because they're just not considered as sexually desirable. And um, that's obviously dehumanizing. It, it makes no sense to me. Well, it means that the prostitution remains an area where racism is entirely acceptable. Yes, it's, and it's just, it's just so normal. Um, the Sometimes, so I run a blog about these sex bias and what they say, and sometimes they find it and they talk about it and they're like, they don't understand why we're upset about how they talk. They're just like, oh, but like these women are ripoffs, like the stupid Romanian criminals, like they're just, why are you upset about how we talk? They don't get it. Some of them form this sort of subculture where they just really normalize misogyny, but I think it's important to remember that a lot of sex buyers, like I said, are completely ordinary men. They might even be relatively respectful. I don't even think they're necessarily terrible fathers or friends. They just don't think that the woman in sex trade, maybe not always consciously, is as three-dimensional a human as everyone else. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Um, somebody told me that um, in one brothel, the, the local neo-Nazi met the local human rights activist. So you see, there's no, there's no, uh, not yeah. necessarily any good, any good sex buyers out there, or maybe they're all good in their ways, you know? But they're certainly the same with the rapists. They're not recognizable by they have a creepy look about them or they're socially isolated. They can be the head of state and they can be the homeless man and anyone in between. Literally. And that's why I should ever be surprised when we find out that a man of our acquaintance is a sex buyer. We should. Oh, yeah. Literally anybody. And I think that's the scariest bit, because if you acknowledge that any part of this is abusive or dehumanizing, then you're going to have to live with the fact that you probably know men who participate. Yeah. Not all of them are like, I want to go out and harm a woman. Some of them have just grown up and it's normal. Some of them have never thought about it. A lot of them do know, however. A lot of them do know about the level of abuse and drug use, et cetera, and they don't care. Well, my impression is a lot of them are just focused very much on themselves. I've heard gap year, I travel a lot on trains in Europe, and I've heard gap year students saying, oh, yes, we went there. And they said, why don't you try this? And we went and there was this woman, you know? They're, mm -hmm. they're so, so focused on their own experience and their yeah. own, you know, sexual fun. I don't think necessarily it entered into their heads to think what it might be like for the woman. It was all about them and how much fun it had been. Because if I get a normal service, like if I get my hair cut or I get a massage, I'm not, I mean, I as a decent human being do care if like my service provider maybe looks upset, but um, it's not my responsibility to make them happy or comfortable necessarily. I shouldn't harass them, but I'd just be like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll just buy this or I'll just get this. Um, 
and the, the sex bearer has the same attitude. Well, it's it's a service, so it's not my responsibility if she's happy or comfortable. Um, I think one of the comparisons that I use is um, the nail nail salons. There's a lot of yeah, human yeah. trafficking into nail salons. So, um, but in the nail salon, um, it might be harder to tell if someone's comfortable doing your nails than if you're having sex with them. I think it is your absolute um, responsibility with every sex partner to check, oh, are they happy? Are they comfortable? Yes. And in the sex trade, one, a lot of men don't care, and two, they can't know for sure ever because they paid her to smile. Yes, exactly. Yeah, she's, she's paid to pretend that she likes it, isn't she? Whatever they dish out. Yeah. And many men have told us they don't care yeah. um, if women that they use sexually are traffic controlled or drugs. And they're used to having no empathy. And this is maybe part of the way that, that young boys are brought up, you know, to suppress their feelings and not necessarily to empathize. Um, they're channeled into lots of physical activity and educational attainment. Um, and they, they can choose to believe the myths and put their own sexual whims above the basic safety of the woman that they're using. Um, and they're using the money that they're privileged to earn at higher rates than women to get non-mutual sexual gratification from them. Is it very difficult to have a nuanced discussion about these long-standing misogynist social systems like prostitution? How helpful is it to condemn the man? And, and what, what can we really do? Is what we really need is to change their behavior, isn't it? I think so, but it's one of these issues where I haven't, I, I would not pretend to have found like the big answers because this is a, an issue across all fields of trying to prevent male abuse, men's abuse of women and, and kids and other men. Um, how do we really change them? Just locking them in a jail doesn't change the behavior. Like, I don't believe personally that uh, abolishing jails is also going to fix it. We know that most abusers never even see a day in jail in the first place. So if you got rid of them, for most of them, nothing changes. But um, finding a way, some people I know believe in um, reforming men. I, I'm not 100% sure about that. I think it does work with some who... I think most men, like they're not psychopaths, they have the capacity of empathy, they're deciding not to turn it on. If you can find a way to make him switch on their empathy, I think you do, you can have an impact. Um, but I couldn't say for sure how and with whom it might be successful. What I believe most in is um, boys and just young men who are growing up, who are still, who can be pushed in one or other direction. We're probably never gonna 100% get real of violence against women. Pro uh, unfortunately, I think so. But we're going to try and reduce it as much as we can. And I think that starts with um, holding uh, boys accountable um, for abusive behavior um, or in giving them positive role models Just um, and just having very strong values present in society as I think most on the political left or even a lot of people who have other political beliefs, just kindness and respect and attention to other people and their needs and boundaries no exceptions for that, especially with a sexual partner, no exceptions. Yeah, I think yeah, if we really instill yeah. those, we can. And some of the countries who have tried, um, there's indications that it, there are improvements, um, though it's probably gonna take generations, I believe. I think it's, it's, it's not gonna be over overnight at all. And when you say reform, it's got that um, connotation of, of religious conversion, hasn't it? I don't think anybody is gonna get reformed. But behaviour change is maybe a far more achievable thing. And Sweden achieved a huge behaviour change in the volume of, of um, prostitution by changing the system, isn't it? I think so, sometimes when you, it's like a naughty child, sometimes if you pay a naughty child a lot of attention, they will use that behaviour as a means of getting your attention. And, and even if it's negative attention, they'll enjoy the attention because that's what they want. Whereas if you change the rules and they, the child finds that instead of being told off and, you know, reasoned with and, it's just hitting a boundary and it's not getting what it's want. It will go away and reflect. And I say it, a boy or a girl, will go away and reflect and think it's not worth doing that again. And the behavior will, you know, reduce. I mean, that's that's one thing that I think um, would be helpful if we could show, and I think there's truth to that, that um, paying for sex isn't necessarily very satisfying. It doesn't really make men happy. And they are, they are, they might not know it, but they are paying a price. Because um, it's just going to be harder or impossible to have real meaningful relationship with women. Some of them probably don't care about that, but it is a loss. And I think if we could make that more visible to them, that might be one thing that has an effect. I think especially when you consider a lot of them are also using porn in their spare time and 
you know, the, the more extreme stimulus you accustom yourself to doing, to, to get, you're going to find an ordinary woman in an ordinary situation who you might actually think could become a much wanted girlfriend. It's not going to do it for you sexually. So they're, they're kind of killing their own sexual instincts in a way. And they, I always think that the, the more paid sex you, get, you do, the, the less your chances of actually forming a real relationship with a w real woman. Um, someone just mentioned this in the comments that Sweden has started tackling the sex trade, but part of the sex trade is pornography, and that is still super pervasive. And well, even if we uh, decrease the sex trade, but women are still being abused in front of cameras, I think pornography is really going to have to be the next big thing. How do we include that? How do we include support? And we do want destigmatization for women who have been in porn, like we want to restart uh, if they want to leave and restart new lives and not have people hound them and, and harass them and think of them as less uh, for having been there. Um, that's going to be the next big challenge, uh, supporting women out of that industry, putting in prevention. Right now, there's so much promotion of the, especially the, um, what is it, the personalized, I just call it personalized pornography, where you upload images or videos to a site and the women just film themselves. There's so much harm denial around that. That is super dangerous. I know women who have gone through that form of the sex trade. And even though there's no one touching them, these images are online forever. They have no control mm -hmm. over who sees that, uh, how, where it goes. They can never take it back. A lot of them too are subject to the whims of the market that push them to do sex acts in front of the camera. That can be humiliating, painful, even injurious. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to have to tackle that and um, we're going to have to, and I really don't have the answers on that, but a lot of people have started working on it. We need to do more. How are we going to um, stop? That's, that's where I started. Um, porn being the first sort of contact for many with like naked bodies and sexuality in an, an explicit manner. What can we do to change that? That's another very big question. We'll have to leave that for another time. We're very encouraged that here in our Westminster Parliament, we've got an all party group on sexual exploitation who have actually recommended that our Parliament consider adopting the Nordic model in the UK. We were very encouraged that although they were got at by the pro sex trade lobby, they actually evaluated the evidence. And I was in the meeting where they said, actually, we've looked at the claims made that it's all fine and lovely, and we found that they don't stack up. So we're going to recommend the Nordic model. So fingers crossed, it's a long shot, but we would like that to uh, come into law. Um, I understand you've created a new word. Would you like to tell us what a pedo criminal is? Oh, I should say I didn't create that. Um, that I don't know who where it comes from. It developed somewhere in the anti-child abuse movement in Germany. I think it's it, it must be of German origin. A pedo criminal is. I've written about the sexual exploitation of children and how it relates to the sexual exploitation of adults because those two are super hard to distinguish. Uh, in in, in in theory and practice, because right, these abused kids, exploited kids become adults. The day she turns 18, it's legal. Um, well, that's that's questionable, but the term is, um, I find it helpful. I don't believe in forcing other people to adopt language. This is just a suge suggestion for others who might feel more comfortable with that word. Um, it just makes two things clear. One, philic means love. So pedophilic means someone who loves children. And we're like, no, it's not love. It's be You're abusing yeah, someone. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. definitively a crime that you cannot have sex with children. It's always abuse. The criminal makes it very clear. Also, I think pedophilic sounds for some people like a sexual orientation. It's not a sexual orientation. Um, and um, more importantly, a lot of men and some women who abuse children also abuse adults. And when we have it in our mind that oh, someone pedophilic only targets children, we miss the reality that these are often, for example, men who abuse their wives and their daughters. They will take anyone who's vulnerable. And they're not necessarily hyper-focused on kids, they're hyper-focused on vulnerability and opportunity. And I think that yeah. term helps on those two fronts. Yeah, I'd agree with that, yeah. Tell us about invisible men. Um, so I don't know who started it. I think I believe it started in Great Britain. It's a series of projects where um, women, I believe feminists from different countries, they collected statements of sex buyers and just put them out there, like no comment, just here are the statements. How, 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 do, how do we feel when we read this? Not, not the um, news reports that we get about um, someone making lots of money and being very happy and escorting which are often just thinly veiled advertisement for an escort agency. I don't know why they're still getting printed, but um, 
if we read those statements instead, we just get a whole another picture of the industry. And we have those sites for Great Britain. Uh, we have one for Canada, uh, France, Israel, and then I made the German version. And um, trying to just show these different patterns of what happens and most centrally how this dehumanization and violence that we've talked about, um, men are not scared of consequences. But um, not well, that's changing recently, very slowly. They are scared that the Nordic model might come to Germany and they don't want it. They hate it. They're like, oh my God, if this happens, I'll have to quit. Um, and um, I think if you need like strong evidence for the Nordic model, it's that sex trade profiteers who, again, care about their bottom line, not women's well being 99.9% .9 of the time, and the men who pay really vehemently do not want this to happen. So if it's really giving them more power as the op um, opposition claims, why are they so vehemently against it? Makes no sense. It's interesting geographically, isn't it? Because you, you've got, um, Ireland's got the Nordic model. Um, France has got the Nordic model. And there's a sort of route up Europe. You know, obviously the Scandinavian countries have got the Nordic model. And you, you just wonder how the trafficking routes are going to get disrupted, aren't they? If Germany were to go Nordic model, it would be very hard to go around that great big block of land from Southern Europe, around both France and Germany to uh, take women from country to country. That would really upset the apple cart, I think. But we know that this does work. It, it's not gonna solve all issues overnight. And I think we need to be really hawkish about the government making um, um, uh, making sure the promise of investing in support for women. Because if we forget about that, or that's not good enough, or that's not um, spread out enough, then um, we, we can have a lot of women falling through the cracks. So we need to keep an eye on that. But at the same time, we know some areas of Germany um, do already punish sex buyers. Unfortunately, they also punish women and they're more likely to arrest women, but they sometimes arrest sex buyers. And we do know that there's less prostitution in those areas, not zero, but less, and that men are scared to go there. So we already know it works on that micro scale. So if we were to actually have meaningful implementation, there's a lot that could happen um, on the bigger scale. There's, you know, looking hopefully at this, there's a lot of, of of the things they could do to make it better, isn't there? If, if anyone can do it. Tell us about your fundraiser, Ellie, and why that's necessary. Um, so um, if, if some people have money to give, um, like I mentioned, there's women in the sex trade in Germany right now, some of them don't even have enough food. That's how basic their needs are. And if they want to get it, they have to, if they want to apply for government funds, um, they have to be a legal resident, which a lot of them aren't. They have to go through all this, this long bureaucratic process of proving, giving up all their documents, and they might not know how and when to do that, or it might take a very long time. And so the survivor network, uh, sex trade survivor network, um, Netzwerk Ella, is um, taking donations. Um, right, there's the information in the chat. <laughs> Information yeah. Make sure to put in the keyword um, Ella. I think it's just the keyword Ella to know it's it's going to go towards them. Um, they're going to put this money directly um, into sending sending uh, food stamps to women, which is, I mean, obviously um, we wish we could do more, but that's the start. That's what they're going to do. And um, if you give money, that's what it's it's at least have women fed. And then um, we're working obviously towards more than just food, which they deserve obviously. Well, please, if you can spare some money, pass it on to those women in Germany who are suffering so badly in prostitution at the moment. Ellie, thank you so much for joining us. It's been great to hear your um, work on the uh, sex trade, and we hope that you'll come back and talk to us again sometime. Um, thank sure. you all for attending. It's been great to um, have you all part of it. And um, next time we've got um, a survivor of the sex trade, we've got Rachel Moran whose book Paid For, you might have read when it came out back in 2013. So we're going to have Rachel here to update her experiences of running Space International, an international survivors organization, and tell us about the project, the, um, the um, way that the Nordic model has been working out in various different countries and what's happening in Ireland. So we'll look forward to welcoming her next week. We've also got, uh, in future weeks, we've got uh, Michael Conroy, who runs the uh, Men at Work project, educating men and boys to um, be more respectful of women and women's sexuality. And we've got Rachel Rosario, who's um, agreed to come and do a webinar with us um, in a few weeks time. So lots of good things coming up. Thank you very much for attending and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you all again soon. We'll say cheerio.